Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. -on -one. Singularity One-on-One -on -one is a regular feature of singularityweblog.com where you can go and download it or listen to it in full. Today, my guest on the show is Natasha Vitamore. Natasha Vitamore is a PhD researcher at the University of Plymouth, a theorist and media designer. She has been referred to as the first female philosopher of transhumanism, a spokesperson for super longevity, and a superhuman object of desire. <laughs> Natasha is best known for designing primo post human, future human prototype, which project applies nanotechnology, biotechnology, artificial general intelligence, robotics, neuroscience, and advanced medicine. She is a visiting lecturer at more academic institutions that we have time to list here, and she is also the former president of Extra P Institute. She is currently on the board of directors of Humanity Plus, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, advisor for the Singularity University, Lifeboat Foundation, Alcor Life Extension Foundation, and visiting scholar at 21st Century. Her writings have been published in numerous books. She has appeared in more than 24 televised documentaries and has been featured in magazines including the New York Times, Wired, and many others. So without further ado, let me welcome Natasha on the show and say, welcome, Natasha. It is a great privilege to have you on Singularity One-on-One -on -one here today. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be here, and I'd like to meet this person. She sounds fabulous. <laughs> you know, when you don't think about yourself in these ways. Um, so when I, I listen to you, I'm going, oh, I have done something meaningful with my life. <laughs> so thank you for reminding me of you know, some reasons why I ought to feel good about my work and um, Thank you. That's sweet. Well, thank you. It is our pleasure. You have done many meaningful things, and uh, w they would be the topic of our conversation here today. But before we actually start looking at the specific accomplishments, let us go a little bit further back and start at the beginning. Um, how did your interest in philosophy and technology in general came to be, and how did it move on to issues such as the technological singularity and transhumanism in particular after that? You know, it's, it's an interesting narrative, and, and like everyone else, I have my narrative that um, caused a difference in my life or a change in my life. Uh, to be precise, it was in 1979. I was living in a ski resort in Colorado called Telluride, and I was a little bit of a jet setter. I owned three businesses, a house with... Um, uh, two partners, and I lived a very lovely lifestyle, but I knew something was missing in my life. Interestingly enough, Telluride has many different festivals, including the Telluride Institute um, Technology and Science Festival. And in 1979, um, the Lifton Zolines and Richard Lohenberg put together a project called Arts and Sciences 79, in, um, which was funded in part by the National Endowment of the Arts and the Telluride Institute. And at that festival, I was invited to be one of the speakers, and I was a painter at the time and performance artist. I was invited to, to present. I was so stunned by the quality of other people there who were involved in technology and science, and I realized there's this whole world that I hadn't even thought about. So um, in regards to the, the robotics, virtual reality, um, um, synthetic virtual environments, and this is in 1979, so the human computer integration was, was fairly new in the arts, and Harold Cohen was there, and Harold Cohen is uh, the first artist to use artificial intelligence and robotics in his work. So lo and behold, I met Harold and um, a number of other astute artists and scientists, and my life changed. I moved to Los Angeles. I became involved in the film industry as both a, a designer and a theorist and performer. And I kept on turning more towards technology. And I left the film industry because it was so far behind in technology. Um, most of the films were dystopic. Science fiction, great, great themes, great um, animation, great direction, great use of technology in films. But it was the theme, thematically, the science fiction films were... Um, not where I wanted to head. So I kept on turning the corner and looking for a community of people, 
of uh, intellectuals, um, thought leaders within the future, and especially looking at humanity and what we could become. And I ran across an idea called the transhuman. And in 1983, I wrote the transhumanist art statement, uh, setting uh, a principle or a, a set of tenets about uh, what we could become if we could live longer, if we could enhance our physiology, if we could augment our brain. Um, so it, it de- developed there out of cybernetics and second-order cybernetics, and I haven't looked back. So it's, it's been a continuous journey to find um, not only the sciences and technologies which could help us develop um, a future of numerous potentials and solve a lot of the problems we have today, such as environmental problems and problems with the human psychology and mental, mental illnesses, etc., and human physiology, disease, and death, but also looking for a, uh, a set of visionaries who not only understand this but want to be the uh, purveyors of these ideas. So I feel very fortunate that I um, did meet a lot of futurists and scholars of uh, human enhancement uh, sciences and technologies. You know, I was reading, uh, as part of my preparation for this interview, I was reading your manifesto, and the last two lines of it, if I can remember, were saying something like, as our tools evolve, so shall we. And that very much reminded me to uh, an interview I did with Kevin Kelly a couple of weeks ago, uh, and in his book, What Technology Wants, he says in one place that human is a process, it's not an entity. So I thought, hmm, that's very much the same idea, I think, about the, the constant evolution or progress or change or, or sort of a, it's not a finished entity, it's an ongoing process. No, it's not. And I, I think Kevin Kelly's book, I'm reading it right now, it's, it's really a, a stunning book about the history of, of human. And uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see how he not only packages the idea of what technology wants, but he prefaces it in, in the evolution of our, the hominids. So it's, it's an exciting book. And another element here, which I, I'd like to just mention, uh, three years ago, I think it was maybe two years ago, I gave a talk at the Artificial General Intelligence, or AI, conference put on by Ben Gertzfeld at the University of Memphis Mm -hmm. at the Federal Express Foundation there. And my talk was uh, about intended consequences. And I was looking at Artificial General Intelligence as a technology that if we're going to build, we ought to put ourselves in the position of the potential of AGI and think about what it wants. Um, I was criticized a little bit for this talk by a couple of AI folks because they didn't understand a strategy and um, scenario planning and the systems analysis. But if you want to understand technology, you have to not necessarily anthropomorphize it, but you need to put yourself within the, the system of the technology and consider, well, if I was this technology, oh, hypothetically, what would I want to achieve my goal? And it helps you take a look at what some of the intended and unintended consequences could be. Absolutely. But let me go back to one interesting detail of your biography. Uh, If I get it correct, you were actually first an artist and a performer and a a business person before you actually became interested in in philosophy and, and technology and transhumanism. That is correct. So how, that's quite a, substan- a, a fundamental almost like change in, in worldview and in, in activities, in, in vocation, I, I would imagine also in lifestyle even to a certain degree. Uh, how did you come about this change? Was there something that pushed you towards it or how did it happen? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think part of my psychology is to change and to create um, – explorations where I have to find out who I really am. You know, you, we uh, talk about the walkabout, you know, um, a term used for the Aborigines in Australia or mm-hmm. even the Navajo Indians, they, they send their young male youths on quest to have a vision about who they're going to become in their life. I take that very seriously. And as an artist, it's always been part of my particular um, palette of tools. I've done this a number of times in my life. Um, 
I remember when I was 20 years old, maybe 21, I had been at the University of Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee, and I went to high school there in Memphis from New York, which was an interesting change. But I was a model and um, in a number of beauty contests and um, uh one of the the women of the South that was, you know, like the queen of the fraternity and the sweetheart of this and that. And it was so offensive to me. I mean, it, it was fun and exciting and, you know, it built the ego. But I left there um, at 20, maybe 21 years old, and I went to live with the Navajo Indians. And that was a total change in my life from being in this high-end social, you know, evening gowns and cocktail dresses on the weekend to going to, I dressed like a boy, I had long braids, I was totally androgynous, living with a medicine man and his wife who ended up being the uh, foremost Navajo um, uh, shamans. I'm sorry, uh, I lost the sound there for oh, a sec. The, the foremost Navajo shamans of the Navajo kingdom. That was a change. I did it again later on when I went to Italy to study. And leaving Telluride, going to L.A., to the film industry from this beautiful environment. And from going from an artist um, who's a performance artist and a painter to going into technology and philosophy was a shift. But if we look at the arts, most artists, and perhaps this is a generalization, but let's just take a look at it, for example. Painters become film directors. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it that way, the painter wants to walk into his or her painting. To sit in a studio and paint is a wonderful experience, to be sure, but it often gets rather lonely, mm -hmm. and you're there with your canvas. For example, there's a painting. Sorry, um, something's I, happening. The, the voice is, is gone again. Oh, sorry. The, the painting behind me is, is one of my paintings. I can't hear anything. Oh, here, let's oh, there try you go. this. There you go, oh, yeah. It's back. Okay. It's back. I uh, think the, there may be a loose connection somewhere. 